Chapter 15 of The Gentle Art of Faking by Riccardo Nobili. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jordan Watts, Oxfordshire. Chapter 15 Imitators and Fakers. The Dealer's Silent Partners. The Important and Interesting Guild of Restorers. The Imitator and Unwilling Accomplice. On the Shady Side of Silent Activities. Again the Faker the patrician who supplies the pedigrees the smuggler and his ways the black band wise tactics we now enter the department of the curio dealers silent helpers the manifold activities assembled under the broad if not indefinite name of restorer a brief glimpse into this part of the trade will lead us to another artistic division that of the imitator and these two last classes of an unquestionable character will serve admirably to herald and usher into that deeper darker stratum of the commerce in which the faker represents the principal character that the restorer should be called the curio dealer's silent partner is quite correct as a true definition the day one of these new confidants should feel inclined to boast he would find no mercy from the dealer and no gratitude from the duped or disappointed collector whose eyes he had opened by revealing the truth this was fully exemplified by a clever restorer of paintings employed by an italian antiquary at forty francs a day no mean pay on account of his unusual ability in the imitation and restoration of works by botticelli more especially as well as for other pastiches thinking to start a profitable business of his own as an art restorer and that his merit should be valued per se he disclosed the secret of the made-up botticellis to a rich collector and let out that he himself to all practical purposes had painted the gem of the gallery he was promptly discharged by his employer and the collector to whom he had told the truth became his worst enemy the activity of the restorer is naturally multifarious many-sided as is the trade in curios his methods will be better explained when art faking is described the procedure in imitating restoring and faking is more or less identical though in faking it is more synthetically perfect than when limited to restoring various articles of vertu there are people who consider restoration a blessing others the reverse a regular curse particularly in the case of works of art of no mean merit without doubt the restoring of works of art has at times greatly contributed to their preservation and more than one masterpiece has come down to us thanks solely to some clever restorer who at the right time prevented its complete ruin this is the good side of the profession but as for its reverse the art of restoring has through the ignorance of workers greatly damaged well-known works of art by the repainting or obliterating of different parts often helping deception by embellishing bad art into deceitful good art in this way the art of restoring has proved a bridge to fakery restoration at its best and in the true artistic spirit never consents to falsify any part of the work lies even in art no matter how well they may be told remain lies artistically and ethically speaking the operations of the restorer should be confined to work intended to save a work of art from the ravages of time these operations are many most varied and not at all easy they demand long practice a deft hand patience and skill as well the process of restoration may mean for instance the transference of the layer of paint from a rotted panel to a new one or to canvas the consolidation of a ceiling painting or other deteriorating forms re-varnishing and to a certain extent cleaning in sculpture orthodox restorations appear to be of a more limited character being chiefly confined to collecting broken pieces and surface cleaning of course the repairing of limbs and missing parts has its importance if done with great artistic discrimination According to responsible art critics, the restoration of paintings may consist of repainting the missing and obliterated parts, and that of sculpture in the replacing of lost fragments only when decorative parts are concerned, important for the better comprehension of the whole, but not expressing any marked characteristic of the artist. When in the service of the antiquary, the art of restoring has no such scruples or limitations. As a matter of fact, its limits then rest with such restrictions as the dealer's conscience may impose. And it must be confessed that this is rather a narrow and at the same time very elastic boundary. 
The different views as to restoration are epitomized by the curious distinction made by connoisseurs and dealers when judging between the two cleverest restorers of Italy. The upshot is, if you have a painting that needs repairing and you wish to restore it to its former state, go to Cavanaghi, but if perchance you are interested to sell it, go to the other one. Disproportion and overdoing in restoration turns this very legitimate art at times into sheer faking. A bust of a Roman emperor, for example, that may have been found headless and which the restorer completes into a Julius Caesar by copying the head of the great Roman dictator from another statue, represents a form of faking. Yet were our programme one of disclosing the names of saints and sinners, instead of that of pointing out sins, we could designate more than one dealer of good repute who sincerely thinks, we may assume, that his form of daring and attractive restoration cannot be called faking. Another rather questionable form of restoration is that of composing, say furniture or any other ornamental goods, from old bits or fragments taken from various rotten objects. There is no doubt that a tasteful artificer can do effective work by composing a table out of two or three broken ones, but nowadays such is the abuse of the method that we are only surprised that the trick is not more easily discovered. Some of these gross and hastily put together compositions of uneducated dealers must count upon clients not only ignorant, but utterly deprived of good taste. The faking qualities of this method are proved, for as soon as the buyer knows the admixture, he refuses to buy the object. Yet such trickery is generally admitted in the trade. There is perhaps a justification for this method of restoring antiques when the character of the article is decorative, as in certain pieces of furniture, marble or stonework, such as chimney pieces, ornamented doors and so forth. Yet even in such cases, honesty would seem to claim that the buyer be warned as to the extent of the restoration. Nevertheless, the temptation to keep the secret must be great, considering how rarely such patchwork is discovered, even by experts, and how easily it calls forth the praise and enthusiasm of art critics. Another form of restoration of a most questionable character, as the decorative nature of the object cannot be claimed as an excuse, is that by which a painting is transformed or embellished by repainting large missing portions more or less fantastically, or by supplying the artistic quality that is wanting. Such work is either done by totally repainting the missing parts, or by veiling and repainting here and there, so as to give the work the attractiveness of a masterpiece. Naturally, in the vast field covered by the questionable genius of this deceptive art, limits are set by the greater and lesser capacity of the restorer, just as the quality of the restoration determines whether he is to be called a professional repairer of paintings or a faker. It is incredible what an amount of work is executed nowadays intended to give a coquettish character to a daub, or to enhance the value of a fairly good painting. Even many masterpieces sold in recent times have been to our knowledge decorated with fantastic backgrounds of castles and quaint landscapes, and mottoes and coats of arms have been added to portraits. A barrel of alcohol, spirit it is known, dissolves fresh varnish and modern retouching, would accomplish wonders with famous masterpieces of recent acquisition and cause many a disillusionment to the curators of museums. As regards the juggling of poor or deficient works of what is generally called a school into a trompe l'oeil, making one believe it to be a painting by the master of the said school, should Italian export officials be inclined to make public what they intend to remain private, many an astonishing coup de théâtre would reveal the true nature of supposed masterpieces bought by unwary collectors as genuine chefs dœuvre a member of the Board of Exportation explained to the author how it happens that the officials are frequently led into the penetralia of the make-up of a pseudo-masterpiece. Sometimes the work is done so well that it would deceive the very officials and experts of the Export Bureau. In this case, the antiquary, who has sold the painting and is desirous that it should reach its destination without hindrance from the export office, pays a visit to the inspector and shows him a photograph of the supposed masterpiece, as it appeared before its coquettish restoration. After this graphic proof, the office has nothing more to say and permission to export is granted. 
the members of the commission do not consider themselves to be responsible to collectors, but they do demand documents as guarantees and two photos, one taken before restoration, one after, are generally exacted and kept in the office. One of the commission showed us some of these photographs, two in number for each object, before and after the restoration. One could hardly believe the miracles accomplished in this line. Botticini easily becomes a Botticelli after a few caresses by a clever hand, and we know cases in which a mediocre work by Ridolfo Ghirlandaio has been turned into a Raphael. These photographs are exacted by the inspectors as a protection from any possible accusation from the central department located in Rome. When the press gives an elaborate account of some American having captured a masterpiece, giving facts and details, and the reproduction of the chef dœuvre adding that it comes from Italy, when London art magazines go into ecstasies over some newly acquired find and wonder how the Italian government came to allow such a magnificent find to slip through its fingers and cross the frontier, the central office in Rome naturally becomes alarmed and demands an explanation from the local office responsible for the exportation permit. As a convincing answer, the two photographs are then sent to Rome, with the consequence that the case is dismissed. The various export officers, whose chief duty it is to impede the exodus of fine works of art, do not consider themselves under any obligation to prevent sham masterpieces from leaving Italy. The imitator, a type to figure later as a help to the better understanding of the faker, occasionally becomes an involuntary or accidental accomplice in deception. His complete equipment, his excellent work, which but for his rectitude and scruples might turn him into a formidable faker, are frequently exploited by others, who, on coming into possession of some of his good imitations, launch them upon the collector's world, just as they might any species of faked work of art. Many of the noted bastard masterpieces in museums are the work of imitators that have been palmed off by tricky dealers without the consent or knowledge of the artist, and it has often been the latter who has helped in the discovery of the fraud. There are also cases when simple plagiarism or chance similarity has been turned to advantage by shrewd people. The fact that Trolbert's painting greatly resembled Corot was sufficient to give corrupt dealers the chance to pass off Trolbert's landscapes as works by the famous French master. This was done, of course, in spite of Trolbert's protests, who never thought of imitating Corot. It is curious when some work of a clever imitator or genial faker falls in the course of time into the hands of the restorer to be repaired, there are circumstances in which modern paintings may need repair. Something still more extraordinary happens to a clever restorer and imitator living in Siena who received from England one of his own paintings, one of his first imitations of Lorenzetti, obviously damaged and entrusted to him for restoration. There are other characters which will form the subject of a more particular study. These individuals belong to the shady side of the commerce and have no redeeming points whatever. They comprise fakers, forgers, smugglers, deceivers at large, and the whole clan included in the vague and broad term the Black Band, as some collectors call them. The faker is the deus ex machina in the most varied kinds of deception. Fakers are not only those who furnish spurious works of art and well-imitated articles of virtu, but also those who help in any form or manner to dispose of sham objects. Thus the parts played by masquerading aristocrats, lending their names and swearing to heirlooms, the debased patricians helping to build the reputation of an artistic product are forms of faking, as well as others which aim at cheating or deflecting public opinion or a genuine appreciation, forms of faking that will be more clearly outlined when degenerate varieties of art sales are described. One of the most clandestine helpers of art and curio dealing, and one who is in close contact with the dark side of the commerce, is the smuggler, a genuine specialist not resembling other smugglers, but with characteristics of his own worth notice. Needless to say, smuggling has no raison d'etre in such countries as have no custom laws to regulate the export of artistic goods, nor put duty upon their entrance within the precinct of the state. It is also obvious that the dual form of such legislation, laws to prevent exportation and importation dues, has produced two corresponding kinds of smuggling, one aiming to baffle prohibitive laws on exportation, and the other trying to undervalue artistic goods generally taxed ad valorem. 
Italy being the classical country of art treasures which have been exploited for centuries, and the first to issue laws and penalties on the subject, it is naturally ahead in the cryptic art of smuggling. The high tariff of the United States, but recently abolished, and the incredible prices paid by the citizens for antiques and works of art in general, make it the country best adapted to illustrate the branch of smuggling which aims to avoid custom house dues. When reading old and modern laws promulgated against illicit exportation of works of art, one cannot help wondering how such daring still exists, and how there should still be people willing to brave the severity of these laws. The Medicis, it is known, prescribed punishment in the second half of the 16th century. The papal laws that followed were, if anything, even more draconian, to say nothing of the iron laws of the former kingdom of the two Sicilies, the severest of them all. Modern governments may not impose prison and galley so freely upon the culprits, but they are no less hard on the transgressor. Money fines are certainly exceedingly heavy, they amount at times to large fortunes. The present laws on the export of art from Italy have a preventive character which the old regulations had not. Every owner of a work of art is himself eventually responsible, and is bound to bring it before the inspectors of the export office, who, after close examination, give or withhold permission to pass the frontier. When permission is granted, there is a tax to be paid, averaging between 5% and 20% ad valorem, according to the inspector's estimate, and should the object leave the country after permission has been refused, the owner is held responsible and may be called before the tribunal to answer for his actions and to pay damages. An Italian adage runs, Fata la legge trovato l'ingano, which in a free translation may be rendered, Make a law and the means of evasion are found. This is somewhat the fate of the protective laws regarding art in Italy. The more stringent and circumspect they are, the lawbreakers apparently become correspondingly bolder and more astute. The way in which Italian authorities have been hoodwinked at times points to the magnitude attained by the shrewd activity of the lawbreakers, and to how their art has almost been turned into a science, even calling in the aid of psychology. In this case, a deep study of the faulty idiosyncrasies of the officials. A few skirmishes between the two parties concerned will serve to demonstrate the variety of the modus operandi adopted by the lawbreakers and their final success over an easily conquered opponent. In the case of a painting of unusual artistic value, a work that has not been put upon the prohibited list of the official catalogue, and the reproduction of which is unknown to the authorities, but which might, nevertheless, by its good qualities catch even the generally inexperienced eye of the inspectors, mostly art critics of the literary species, the work is transformed into a daub without damage to the painting or change to any essential part. The process is exactly the reverse of that helping a poor painting by clever restoration and additions. Here it is a question of reducing a good work to an apparently bad one, obtainable chiefly by veiling the good qualities of the work, altering good drawing by cleverly introducing offensive disproportion of limbs, etc. There is a difference, however, between the work intended to embellish a painting and that aiming to do the reverse. The former, with the idea of facilitating the sale, is permanent. The latter is only temporary, just to get permission to export. This latter work must be executed in such a way that it can be washed out without damage to the work after the painting has safely crossed the frontier. For this operation, a coat of glue is generally given as a preparation. Then the modifications are painted in with tempera on the layer of glue, which is easily dissolved in water, together with the retouching when the work is to be restored to its original state. Similar treatment is also given to statues, busts and bas-reliefs, more especially when of material that allows the addition of parts that can be removed afterwards without damage to the original. How well the work is done and how successful it proves is hardly credible. Security lies in the fact that should a question be raised afterwards when the work has been sold to some noted collector outside the country, nothing can be said or done as permission has been granted and there is no pictorial proof that the work had been done for the occasion. Naturally, this method is not of daily or common occurrence, nor, as we have stated, can it be applied to well-known works the photographs of which could be obtained to contradict evidence. 
Sometimes more is undertaken than retouching or apparently maiming the artistic qualities of a work. One antiquary who intended to send off a painting that might be detained at the export office pasted paper over the picture, then with the usual coat of glue painted in tempera a very mediocre landscape. With this he obtained the export permit and packed his work as prescribed by law before the eyes of the authorities, after which the case was sealed by them and safely sent on its way to the frontier. Leaving the endless tricks which might be grouped more or less with the above, we will take up other curious ways of eliciting permission, methods showing the deceiver to be as good an observer of human nature as he is a true psychologist. A noted bric-a-brac dealer entered the export office, bringing a de la Robia with him. According to custom, when the official inspection was sought, the bas-relief was packed ready for the permit and seal of the office. Taking off the lid of the case, the dealer handed the documents to the inspector to be signed. "'You must take us for fools,' said the latter, struck by the beauty of the work. "'Do you really think we allow such works to leave the country?' "'Well, don't say anything, and I'll explain things. Look here.' The bas-relief was taken from the case, and with a pocket-knife, the dealer scraped a piece of plaster from the apparently aged back, showing not only freshly baked clay, but the mark of a well-known modern factory of ceramics. "'Modern? I confess I should never have thought it. Keep our secret,' pleaded the bric-a-brac dealer. "'You see they go to America.' Satisfied that his professional honour was safe with the dealer, who would naturally not expose the blunder, and not considering it within the sphere of his activity to see that Americans were not fooled as he himself had been, the inspector granted permission, provided the document should be honestly endorsed by the declaration modern. Later on the dealer presented himself with a similar work. The case was hardly opened when the same inspector exclaimed, Oh, these Americans, another cuckoo. Well, as you stop the genuine, we have to content ourselves with sending off imitations, observed the dealer with intentional flattery. They seem to prosper, laughed the inspector, signing the papers and sealing the case for expedition. Needless to say, this time it was a genuine de la Robia, sent off with all the requisite legal papers and labelled by the man of law as a modern work. Some years ago, an antiquary of Rome, the owner of a statue of fine Greek workmanship, knew that if the work should be presented to the export office, permission would be refused. The statue had been excavated in three separate parts and subsequently recomposed, and it was thought wise to take it apart again and send it off in that state. The head, the finest piece, was taken across the frontier as luggage by a tourist. The torso was sent out of Rome to get the permission from the office of another city, and the legs were the only part to leave the capital with free and unsuspecting permission from the central office. A marble statue, now in the Museum of Art in Berlin, a work of heroic proportions, passed the frontier in two parts, each piece packed in separate trunks such as are used by ladies. The statue had been sawn in two along the line of drapery in such a way that when the two parts were united the joint could hardly attract attention. That the great weight should not arouse suspicion, the two marble blocks were hollowed out and thus considerably lightened. The two parts of the statue were first conveyed to Paris, that haven of smuggled goods, where they were reunited and the reconstructed statue was finally sent to its destination. Though cleverly put together, the joint is noticeable to an experienced eye upon close inspection. One wonders whether the authorities of the museum ever discovered that their fine specimen of Roman Renaissance, which had been bought in a single piece in Italy, with the assurance that it was the dealer's affair to get it to Berlin, had been delivered in two patched pieces almost as hollow as a plaster cast. Another curious form of smuggling, which must be classed among the suggestive methods, consists of perturbing and influencing the opinion of the export office employee, or, if necessary, that of his immediate superior, very often the curator of a museum, or the highest authority in artistic matters in the province. This sort of innuendo is accomplished in several ways. Sometimes a confrère will drop into the office as if by accident when the case is there ready for examination, and on seeing the object will exclaim, that awful thing, sold at last. He will naturally be asked to explain what he knows about it. He may say that it was offered to him, but that he had refused it because repainted and restored by so-and-so. He is likely to conclude by saying, ask the man who restored of course, another confederate. Though it may appear naive and clumsy to the outsider, 
this latter method has been known to work extremely well. It is only to be expected, too, when the depth and calibre of Italian official wisdom on art matters is taken into consideration, the post of inspector being filled chiefly by scribblers or art critics, seeking government employment, or perhaps they may be students fresh from a recently instituted university course on art, their main equipment being historical studies. There is no question but that they are excellently informed so far as art erudition is concerned, but they lack experience, and the trouble is that the chief requisite in an office such as the export office is a long experienced and sure eye, with a thorough knowledge of the trade in curios and its peculiar resources in deceit. One word of doubt let fall at the right moment works wonders when dealing with people whose lack of practical knowledge is so appalling. We recall the case of an inspector who felt uncertain as to the artistic value of a painting and finally resorted to the experience of his immediate superior, the curator of a museum and a well-known art writer. On inspecting the work, the latter pronounced it to be a good specimen of the Ferrara school and declared that permission could not be granted. The owner and would-be exporter, an antiquary in great favour, called on the curator, who had had the painting transferred to his own private room with a view to making a careful examination. He directed the curator's attention to the repainted and repaired condition of the work, persuaded finally that the painting was nothing but a shocking piece of modern restoration, the curator granted permission. A friend who was present and noticed the dealer's satisfied smile asked him afterwards whether the work was really so bad as he had represented to the curator. Not a single retouch, was the answer, most genuine. But you convinced him, you pointed out the restored parts. Yes, suggestion is one of our most formidable weapons, assented the antiquary, doubling his crafty smile. Yes, suggestion is one of our best accomplices. Although recognising that many of the employees of the export office are quite unfitted for their difficult task, through their particular form of education, we are ready to admit that to decide almost at sight what may safely leave the country and what must be retained is no easy affair. Imitations at times are so perfect that even the most experienced eye, without mature and well-pondered examination of the object, is apt to be duped. Some years ago, one of the sons of Professor Costantini, a well-informed antiquary of Florence, made a copy of an Antonello di Messina that was in his father's collection. The copy was undertaken to oblige an English friend, and being painted on an old worm-eaten panel of wood, so cleverly imitated the original as to be mistaken for it. When the work was to be exported, the official refused his permission on the ground that it was a great master and must consequently remain in Italy. However, as the young artist insisted in his declaration that it was a copy made by himself, appeal was made to the curator of the Uffizi Gallery in Florence, Professor Ridolfi. The latter confirmed the inspector's verdict, reiterating the prohibitive injunction, and a sort of consultation was held, with the aid of Professor Supino, curator of the National Museum, Professor Elia Volpi, a highly esteemed antiquary of Florence, and a German artist acting restorer of paintings at the Uffizi Gallery. They unanimously declared the work to be old. Some attributed it to Antonello himself, others to his school, there was no suspicion of modernism. The whole affair was afterwards settled as it should have been from the first. Professor Costantini invited Professor Ridolfi and the others to see the original painting at his house. When the high tariff on imported works of art and curios was still in force in the United States, smugglers relied chiefly on undervaluation as orthodox smuggling, namely introduction into the country without any payment of duty, was hardly possible under the vigilance of argus-eyed custom house officials. Thus the grand art of smuggling works of art and antiques of repute, always pliable to circumstances, relied mainly upon the ignorance of the so-called appraisers. At first, a legal estimate enclosed with the documents accompanying the goods from their place of departure was sufficient and very rarely discussed. Gradually, the United States Custom House agents grew suspicious, and to support the low valuation it became necessary to adjust the objects, in very much the same way as was done to obtain export permissions from the Italian office. 
One of the tricks practised in the case of furniture is to take off all ornamental and carved pieces by disjointing or sawing and then polishing or in some way adjusting the place left bare. The ornaments are sent separately to be replaced when the piece of furniture is safely beyond the reach of the custom house laws. Custom house officials all the world over are generally reckoned by trained smugglers to be very poor judges of art. They consider them capable of making a great fuss over the wrong article and letting the dutiable ones slip through their fingers. Something of this kind happened at the custom house of Bercy, France, where, with no intention of smuggling or deceiving the officials, Dazzi, an Italian dealer, came to pay duty in a sort of topsy-turvy way. Together with other things, Dazzi was importing into France a box of modern bronzes, imitating objects of Pompeian excavation and coated with an indecent patina, green as a lizard's skin, and a piece of 17th century silk damask, which according to French law should have been duty-free as only antique goods of the 18th century and onwards pay. After a long confabulation, the appraiser of the custom house decided that being, as he thought, modern fabric the damask must pay duty and the bronzes supposed by him to be two thousand years old might enter free of duty Dazzi saw this queer exchange was to his advantage and submitted to the strange verdict without further observation in italy the law on exportation intended to prevent the exodus of fine works of art is often turned to advantage by sharp dealers who manage to have their mediocre goods detained at the export office and when exportation has been finally permitted make use of the monetary detention to enhance the merits of the object exported this trick has been practised to such an extent that, particularly in America, it is not unusual to hear an amateur extol some bit of rubbish with the remark, it was stopped by the Italian inspectors but my man managed to get it through by greasing the poor. An imitation of the work of Bellano, a bas-relief in clay, was in custody at the export office and afterwards allowed to pass, being recognised as modern. This was quite enough to advertise the work as excellent, so excellent that it was held up at the Italian Export Office. The bas relief is now shown in the collection of a New York amateur, and the romantic tale of the refused permit adds flavour and draws particular attention to the masterpiece, and yet... This is more or less the dark side of the traffic in curios and the various questionable forces that many collectors call the black band. As will be shown later, the black band is a Parisian expression denoting a more restricted field of activity. How is the beginner to cope with such odds? To become acquainted with the particular milieu as to be avoided in the commerce of antiques requires time. To learn to detect restorations and repairs, we mean undue repairs, is an art in itself that demands considerable experience. To sum up, while striving daily to become more efficient, relying as little as possible on the help of others, or knowing how to choose the right sort of aid, it is most important to be circumspect, to assume in principle that the beginner is likely to be duped at the start, and to believe that there is more wisdom than people are ready to think in the advice of Paul Eudel. Soyez athese en objet d'art, be sceptical in art objects. End of chapter 15chapter 16 of the gentle art of faking by ricardo nobili this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by jordan watts oxfordshire chapter 16 the artistic qualities of imitators sculptors a few notable examples bastianini's art and the adventures of his girolamo benivieni a modern imitation of renaissance art entered at a munich museum as a genuine antique the sculptor's art and method the verrocchio robia and company limited signor natali's art and signor bonafedi's patina various methods of would-be makers of old masters painting the Sienese Imitative School, Mr. Salting's Experience, Professor Ezio Marzi's Imitation of the Flemish School, Stone and Ornamental Work, Professor Orlandini's Art, Iron Work, Weapons, etc. 
From the point of view of art, the creator of finds, the imitator of masterpieces, and faker of sham chefs-d'oeuvre are not attractive personalities. The value of their art, if it deserves so noble a title, is likely to vanish as soon as the scheme is detected and to leave us with something of the disillusionment experienced when viewing a set of stage scenery by broad daylight. The simple imitator, the man who honestly declares his work to be modern, though of a higher moral standard than his comrade, the forger, is no more likely to win our admiration. The difference between the two, artistically speaking, is that the one is apt to irritate us from the first, the other only after we have been taken in. The first cheats himself alone when he believes his patchwork to be good art, the second is ready to deceive any and everyone who credits his artistic lies. High above these two classes, however, stand a few gifted beings who seem to have actually imbibed the artistic qualities of Renaissance art to such an extent as to have attained a new and genuine personality, modern in date, but old and faithful to the past in creative conception. In this case, imitation becoming creative, as we have said, it rises to the rank of real art. Up to the present, since Bastianini's excellent work was first launched, many of the imitators who followed and who have successfully duped museums and art lovers belong to the commonplace order. The success is chiefly due to the deficiency and lack of practice among curators, collectors and connoisseurs at large. The more recent imitations that have deceived some of the most experienced eyes in Florence, Munich and Paris have revealed the names of two sculptors, Zampini and Natale, who apart from their imitative ability may, like Bastianini, be studied and admired per se. Both these artists have some points in common with the sculptor who puzzled all the French connoisseurs of the Second Empire. Both, like Bastianini and other good and honest imitators, have made the fortunes of others, not their own. Like him, too, have sold their products as modern, only to realise that as soon as believed antique they reached fabulous figures. The portrait bust of Girolamo Benivieni, for which Bastianini received 350 francs, was finally sold to the Louvre for 14,000 francs. Before landing in the Paris Museum, it had passed through the hands of Frepper, a Florentine antiquary, Norleves, a connoisseur who travelled to Italy in search of finds, and Neuwerkerke, Princess Matilda Bonaparte's all-powerful protégé, who was responsible for its acquisition by the museum. This classic piece of fakery is worth recalling in all its details, together with the stir succeeding Bastianini's declaration of himself as the author of the Benivieni bust, and the humiliating figure cut by the officially recognised connoisseurs and art critics after the denouement. Contrary to the general mode adopted by imitators and fakers of copying the various parts here and there from Renaissance work, welding them into a would-be tout ensemble of originality, Bastianini had so imbibed the character of the 15th century that he was able to work without immediate suggestions other than the influence of the recollections and skill he had acquired by copying from good old models in his preparatory periods. Thus the work was done straight from nature, the model chosen being an old man nicknamed the Priore, employed in a cigar factory. When the clay was still fresh, struck by the unusual Renaissance style of the bust, someone suggested the name by which it was finally christened, and Bastianini inscribed the words, Hieronymus Benivieni. The name of Girolamo Benivieni, Savonarola's poet friend, was in keeping with the austere figure of the portrait, and the modest employee of the Florentine cigar factory well represented one of the most illustrious types of Republican Florence. When Nolives exhibited Bastianini's work in 1867 as a specimen of Renaissance sculpture at the retrospective art show of the Palais du champs Élysées, an influential art critic wrote, we have not known Benny Vieni, but are prepared to swear that this portrait must be extremely like him. Who is the artist that modelled it? We are almost tempted to label the work with a string of names from the glorious period of Florentine art. 
Noting, incidentally, that the art critic's temptation to go through a long litany of names by way of attribution is simply delightful, we may state that the illustrious writer was not the only one to be caught and duped by Bastianini's capital work. The supposititious Girolamo Benivieni had turned the heads of all the art intellectuals of Paris. Later on, when Nolive's collection was put up to auction, the bust was acquired, as we have already stated, by Neuwerkerke for the sum of 13,600 francs and was finally placed in the Louvre Museum. It is said that, believing the bust to be antique, Nolives wrote to Bastianini, bantering him upon his gross error of letting such a stupendous find slip from his hands. Finally, the name of Bastianini as the author of the bust leaked out. Admiration began to cool, opinions as to the genuineness of the work were divided, and a long polemic over the case ensued. When Bastianini, up to then an obscure Florentine artist, finally declared in a letter sent to the Diritto, an Italian newspaper, that he himself was the author of the Benivieni, he was supposed to be an impostor. Among others to contest Bastianini's assertion was the talented sculptor Lucen, who went so far as to call the Florentine artist a liar, maintaining that the men who would mould clay into such forms as that of the bust were no more of this world, having long since disappeared. At the end of his invective against the Florentine sculptor, Monsieur Lucen swore that should Bastianini be able to prove himself to be the sculptor of the Benivieni, he himself would be willing to serve such a sculptor if only to mix his clay. It would be tedious to follow the long and spicy polemic from which Bastianini was perforce to issue triumphantly. Pamphlets and articles were written on both sides, Bastianini himself taking part in the controversy and showing himself to be a wit worthy of those old Florentines whom Dante designates as having a spirito bizarro. Irrefutable proofs, the first plaster cast of the head which had been kept by the sculptor, witnesses who had seen Bastianini at work, the assurance of the model and his true resemblance to the pseudo Benivieni, cut short all possibility of further discussion. The actual author of the Renaissance bust that had puzzled the learned public of the French capital was beyond all doubt Bastianini. Naturally, this was not Bastianini's first essay. In the year 1864, a bust by him, an effigy of Savonarola, had been exhibited at the Palazzo Riccardi in Florence. This work, too, was taken for antique. Vincenzo Caponi, a Florentine dealer, secured it for 640 francs and sold it for 10,000. Another work, a charming type of Florentine youth, a girl singing, was sold to Monsieur Edouard André of Paris. Bastianini's imitations are of such excellency that they are now held in high esteem by collectors and are bought by museums at extremely handsome prices. The Victoria and Albert Museum has one of the most complete collections of Bastianini's art, where the whole range of this genial imitator of the Renaissance can be seen almost au complet. Signor Ferrante Zampini whose imitations deceived the Museum of Munich and many good connoisseurs and specialists, worked with different methods. The Pieta, a large lunette which, together with other works, deceived the art authorities of Munich so completely, had passed in Florence from the studio of Ferrante Zampini to the well-known atelier of Signor Bonafedi, a painter of uncommon talent whose ability in colouring and in giving the proper pattern to clay is unrivalled. This work was afterwards sold, for the sum of 1,200 francs, as modern to Professor Paulini, a violinist, who also sold it for modern to a German, and finally, through a string of collectors, the Pieta landed in the Munich Museum for 14,000 francs. It is said that the discovery of its modern authorship was due to a successful antiquary of Florence, a collector who had sharpened his natural alertness after a sad experience when he bought a bronze by a living... German artist as Quattrocento work, and who is in a position to know more than one histoire through a regular network of informants. On this occasion his informant, it seems, was close to hand in the person of his packer. As for other antiquaries who had had no forewarning from kind informants, they have been more or less taken in 
by Signor Zampini's work, which have appeared now and then on the market since the year 1904. Less exception seems to have been taken to the work of the other modern imitator, Signor Natale. His imitations, made previously to his best one, bought by the Louvre Museum, appear to have travelled very far. Some of them are still in undisturbed enjoyment of honour as Renaissance works in private collections. Ferrante Zampini's first work was a portrait of a lady, a finely executed head evidently made under the direct impression of those busts attributed to Lorana, those that Courageau insisted on calling death masks. This piece, however, had no fortune in the world of antiques, it travelled from place to place, and finally, as faithful as a carrier pigeon, returned to the man who bought it from the sculptor. A strikingly fine clay head followed. It closely resembled the portrait of Colleoni, though giving the general of the Venetian Republic a more aged experience than that of the equestrian statue in Venice. It was readily bought as a Verrocchio. Since then, Zampini has produced several works of his peculiar art. Although they have realised large sums of money, his own gains were but small. A curious proof of Zampini's excellence in imitating the Quattrocento is given by the following incident. A French collector bought from a Florentine dealer a genuine piece of Renaissance, and a work by Zampini. After taking the two purchases to Paris, the collector sent back the real article as a fake, keeping the Zampini bust as a recognised authentic object of art. A Munich princess possesses one of the finest works of our sculptor which still defies all evidence, even now after the Munich disclosures have enlightened the Bavarian connoisseurs. Professor X of Florence, a connoisseur whose ability is beyond question and whose experience is highly esteemed among art lovers, bought a clay bust by Zampini, believing it to be the work of the 14th century. Sometime after he had transferred the object to his collection, the clay began to peel off and show signs of the progressive scaling known as spuletare. Footnote. Spuletare signifies the scaling of terracotta, by which it becomes full of little holes, as though pitted by smallpox. The word is derived from buletta, a nail or tack. The poor victim looking as though nails had been roughly drawn out. End of footnote. Zampini, it must be said, often uses imprunetta clay, that used by Della Robbia, and he was not aware that to prevent scaling, a phenomenon that may set in months after the work is baked, this peculiar earth must be moistened as soon as it leaves the oven. Had this been done, the work would have been saved that curious scaling which in the end told the truth about the bust. But for this unforeseen circumstance, the work might still be playing its part in the world of antiques. Professor X, however, knew that antique busts are not liable to suffer from this peculiar kind of smallpox, and called the go-between who had helped in the conclusion of the business and a friend who had shared his admiration, and to them he confided his suspicions. The bust then disappeared for some time. Later, however, the same friend of Professor X, who had admired the bust before it began to scale, was called in to admire it again in the collection of Professor Y, another noted connoisseur, who had bought it as antique. For reasons of his own, possibly so as not to spoil the new owner's pleasure, the friend did not reveal the secret of the make-up. But Imprunetta Clay seemed determined the truth should be made manifest to all, in spite of circumstances. Within a few days, the work that had already been attributed to Verrocchio by the new owner began to peel once more, and the secret of its modern date was revealed a second time. Professor Y, who was an honest dealer and a connoisseur of such ability as to be able to afford a blunder without loss of a well-deserved reputation, laughed at the clever joke played upon him and buried the Verrocchio in his cellar, the Erebus to which all honest antiquaries relegate their bad bargains. The bas-relief which has been bought by the Louvre at a larger figure than any other recent acquisition of this nature is the work of a young sculptor, Natale, a Florentine who has largely emerged as a clever imitator of the Renaissance. The newspapers have already spoken of the last part played by the supposed Verrocchio in the museum and the magnificent sum paid for it. What is not generally known is that the curator's eyes were opened, wisdom and knowledge are often wakened in this way, by an anonymous letter written from an aggrieved would-be partner in the affair who had been, as it were, cut off with a shilling. 
in the handsome transaction. Though Bastianini, Zampini and Natali seem to exploit a common field and work with identical aims, they so essentially differ in quality and character of their work as to deserve a brief comparison. Bastianini, who flourished when connoisseurship was yet without the powerful aid of photography, appears in some way at a disadvantage when compared with the others, and this although his qualities as a modern sculptor, even though academic, were perhaps of a more solid character than theirs. Apart from his Beni Vieni, the seven roller busts and a few heads of aged people in which the sculptor reveals his best and strongest qualities as an imitator of the Quattrocento, his work is of a perplexed and consequently weaker nature. We very much doubt whether some of his female heads now in the Victoria and Albert Museum could deceive in these days even a mediocre connoisseur. In Bastianini's minor works, one is likely to find the explanation of this curious artistic temperament. He was a lover of modern life and prided himself upon cooking macaroni fit to make a Neapolitan blush. He claimed to be the best ball player, giocatore di pallone, of his day, and could pass from modern art to antique imitations with facility that astonishes us. In his less important works, an oscillating mind is evident, swinging like a pendulum between modern and antique art. It is clear that the two artistic personalities worked alternately in Bastianini's mind, leaving no deep or permanent impression. This artist's imitations, consequently, bear every symptom of immediate suggestion, fugitive impressions cleverly caught and blended into a surprisingly harmonious whole, thanks to his uncommon skill in modelling. It is this happy tout ensemble, summing up of qualities and circumstances, that raised the artist above the level of the obvious imitator, more especially when modelling certain heads the characters of which would seem to tally with the original impression, some early souvenir or first work in copying maybe, he had received from the masters of the Renaissance. With Ferrante Zampini, the artistic evolution is somewhat reversed. A man of taciturn disposition, inclined to dream and of mystic tendencies, he must have cogitated, loved and longingly caressed his idea before giving it form. Rebelling against any academic yoke, it was not long before he began an intercourse of sentiment with the work of the past, questioning those old masters as to the reason why their sentiment should clash with scholastic tuition. He must have actually saturated his mind with old forms before taking up the modelling stick. To see him working without a model, without a suggestion even to aid his creation, made one almost believe that through some mesmeric power the soul of an old master had passed into his own, and he was enjoying at the moment all the glorious freedom of irresponsibility. Thus, while Bastianini worked in a well-lighted studio, filled with plaster casts of the creations of Verrocchio, Polo Giulio and other great masters, Zampini models in a small room, working in the faintest of lights, surrounded by bare grey walls. With blinds almost drawn, this sculptor holds that he can dominate the masses with security and be in closer touch with his vision. Perhaps the great unity of his work really is due in part to this unusual method of modelling, a method which, while it permits him to detect errors of mass, and to correct the general lines of composition, at the same time harmonises into a happy ensemble the characteristics of the older style he imitates. It may be said that while Bastianini rarely attempted compositions in bas relief, confining his main work of imitation to heads, Zampini boldly attacked the difficulties of large bas reliefs and grouped figures. Though Zampini's work vaguely suggests reminiscences, either in composition or in form, this sculptor must be credited with an unusual power of synthesis, and we are not surprised that the Munich authorities were deceived by his art. Natali's workmanship is of a different nature. This young artist, the author of The Baptism, the lunette bought by the Louvre as a work of Verrocchio, shows great versatility even when not imitating the old masters, and he is, above all, a virtuoso, a true product of Latin facility. But it must be added that while the lunette of the Louvre shows happy composition, with charming details here and there in its interpretation, it does not possess the intimate qualities, the essential unity of Zampini's work. 
the latter may be taken for Verrocchio or not, according to the ability or appreciation of the critic, but Natale's lunette might be modernised as Verrocchio and Company, or, since in the angels the manner of Andrea Robbia alternates with Verrocchio, we might even go a step further and describe the composite result as Verrocchio, Robbia and Company Limited. Not only because Natale occupies a room in Bonafedi's studio and appears to work under this artist's supervision, at least it was so when we had occasion to study the work of this excellent imitator, but direct from the work in the lunette of the baptism, one feels inclined to look on this young artist as endowed with the defects and good qualities of a painter indulged in plastic work. The composition, for instance, harmonious and rich, with a happy suggestion of light and shade, lacks the directness of form peculiar to sculptors, and the modelling shows here and there, and this even considering the task the artist has imposed upon himself of imitating Quattrocento work, the flatness and dryness of a painter who models without plastic insight or preoccupation. These characteristics, these pictorial qualities, which are not to be seen in Signor Natale's modern work, are perhaps the disguise with which he sometimes veils his touch, the touch of a modern sculptor. Though admiring this excellent imitation, we must say we are surprised at the fact that it was not sooner detected as a modern work. From Bonafedi, a painter possessing great facility in execution and uncommon versatility as an imitator, the mere association of ideas easily leads one to the Siena imitators, who have for years held the privilege of being the strongest imitators of early Quattrocento work. Yoni and others have, unwittingly, deceived more than one connoisseur. One of these Sienese products was bought by Mr. Salting for 20,000 lira. There is no doubt that the imitation bought by Mr. Salting as work of the old Sienese school is one of the best that modern Siena has ever produced. Yet anyone already acquainted with that kind of work, and who has seen at least one specimen out of the many that have met with good success among unguarded collectors, would have not found it difficult to detect the first-rate imitation that so triumphantly entered the Salting collection. It is said that Mr. Salting got his money back, and the painting was returned to the dealer, a remarkable occurrence and a proof of good faith, as usually when the collector finds he has been duped and is not disposed to keep it quiet, the vendor is either not to be found, or has taken prudent measures and good care to be on the safe side legally. In our opinion, the drawing of the Sienese imitator is too calligraphic. It reproduces too closely, namely, the works of well-known originals, and this while the composition is not always free from plagiarisms that are too easily recognisable. Some of the later artists of Florence and elsewhere have broadened the technique, appearing less servile because better versed in the qualities of the old masters, and through this deeper insight their work is more convincing and synthetic. One of these characteristic workers is Professor Ezio Mazzi of Florence, an imitator of the Dutch school, who has never sold his panels as antique, but whose work, it is said, through others, has penetrated into more than one collection, where it is held to be genuine and above superstition. His teniers, now honoured as such, are many, and if Marzi, instead of being stationary in Florence like most of his compatriots, who, generally speaking, never travel, should indulge in one of those erratic trips of which Americans are so fond, visiting collections here and there, he would have good cause to laugh in his sleeve. Like many of his Italian brothers of the brush, Ezio Marzi has eclectic tendencies and a most versatile workmanship. But what places him apart from his confrères, who also imitate the art of the past, is the fact that when he chooses to be Ezio Marzi in his painting, that is to say to paint something of his own, giving a true expression of his own personality, he can do so without infection from reminiscences of his workmanship as an imitator. In a word, Marzi is a painter of mark, extremely original and fully temperamental, a rare thing among imitators of other people's art. As regards his plagiaristic indulgences, he has tried the most varied and dissimilar schools of the past successfully too. His preference, however, for Dutch or Flemish art has finally prevailed. 
Possibly at his first essays, Marzi was the obvious sort of imitator, servile to direct suggestion of form, disguising artistic thefts from old masters by the usual well-matched mosaic. But now this inevitable preparatory period is dismissed and surpassed. When imitating Teniers, this artist is really composing Dutch scenes without a scrap of suggestion in his studio. While Marzi affords us a good type of the imitator in painting, and Bastianini and Zampini show us the best possibilities of assumed characters in sculpture, Professor Orlandini of Florence imitates Quattrocento ornamental sculpture with capital results. We can repeat here the same comment passed on Marzi's art. His works, too, are sold as modern, but alas, how many ornamental chimney pieces and would-be aged lavabos now decorating rooms are Orlandini's work, although ostentatiously shown as pure productions of the Renaissance. Not so pure, though, always, for Professor Orlandini is at times forced to fall in with the customer's ambition and thus allows himself to give full play to over-ornamentation, producing a sort of Quattrocento Usus Americanus. Still, when left to his own artistic bent, we know of no one who can turn out of the Fiesole stone an aristocratic looking chimney piece more closely resembling the work of Desidero da Settignano. As a brief observation, it may be added that Professor Orlandini is a sculptor of the old school who deals chiefly with hard materials this fact greatly contributes to give his art that stern sobriety of line that is a characteristic mark of the renaissance artist in the present flood of imitations it has been urged that honest artists should put their signatures to their modern antiques thus preventing the danger represented by imitations when launched on the market by able impostors there are a few who do sign their productions but we must say such an act does not win the deserved success the buyer seems to demand a certain amount of illusion which would inevitably be destroyed by a signature in full sight. Besides, supposing that to prevent any possible fakery all imitators should decide to sign their work, what guarantee would such a movement represent? Nothing is easier to erase than a signature on a painting, and so far as sculpture is concerned it is a baby trick to cover the artist's mark. Commerce has its risks, risks placing an elective stigma on any enterprise, rendering it more difficult and eliminating the incapable. In our artistic milieu such risks are doubled, thus while imitation and its black sister faking represent a formidable danger, they also, through the said magnified risk, confer upon the elect ones, the true connoisseurs, the exclusiveness of an aristocratic caste. And yet, unlike the beginner, these superior beings who have in a way learned through experience how to cope with dangerous odds repeat with Bonafé, do not trust the collector who never makes a mistake, the strongest is he who makes the fewest mistakes. End of chapter 16Chapter 17 of The Gentle Art of Faking by Ricardo Nobili. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jordan Watts, Oxfordshire. Chapter 17. Fakers, Forgers and the Law. Faking and Fakers. Views of Art Forgers. Too great a productiveness aids the exposure of fakers. The chink in the armour of silence and mystery. Collector's view of the dangerous trade in counterfeited objects. Laws and tribunals. Grotesque cases in courts. Monsieur Charles' autographs. A collector who lacks a Ramesses. The faker for gain and the one for fun. Some moral considerations on fabricators of modern antiques. Moral considerations aside, the faker of objects for collections is far more interesting a personage than some of his duped victims. His artistic personality separates him from the commoner class, the peculiarity of his trade, while not redeeming the disreputableness of his conduct, confers upon him the poetic nimbus of art and mystery, just as an undefined feeling of heroism or chivalry may, to an imaginative mind, turn an old-fashioned brigand into a classical type of buccaneer. 
these mute workers, who actually earn their money by false pretense, deluding and deceiving with callous energy in what a commercial mind might call their line of business, are not infrequently people of scruples and probity in all other respects, men to whom credit might be given with safety. As we have stated before, the collector is partially responsible if excellent imitators sometimes turn into fakers. Ask the forger how it was that he became such, and nine times out of ten you will either hear that he was tired of seeing others make indecent profits out of his work, or that he was prompted by the consideration that there were fools ready to pay ten times the value of his work, provided he did not claim authorship, and would pretend his work was antique. Curiously enough, when questioned about the beginning of their fraudulent profession, some will speak of their transition from honesty to dishonesty with the reticence of a woman gone astray. Others, perhaps the larger number, are boastful and inclined to glory in the success accorded to their fakes. La Rochefoucauld has written in his Maximes that it is easier to deceive oneself than others. The vaunting class of fakers have somewhat reversed the terms of this saying, their common tenet being that it is easier to cheat others than to cheat oneself. This maxim, however, gives the faker undue confidence and a too prolific activity in creating sham masterpieces, and eventually contributes to the exposure of his fraud and the final ruin of what he considers, and what has proved to be, a most remunerative business. Many discoveries of falsified chef d'oeuvre are due to overproductiveness of the faker, his self-confidence augmenting his activity to alarming proportions, it naturally increases the probability of discovery. However, the faker is perforce a closed-mouthed fellow, always on his guard and very rarely taken, as one might say, by surprise. Nevertheless, he too possesses what might be called, in fanciful metaphor, the Achilles' vulnerable spot where his silence may be attacked. It is his pride that must be tickled. It was an aim of mine in the past to trace forgery in art to its origin, not exactly as a hobby, but in the belief that in these days it is important to know how works of art are imitated and faked, that it is part of modern connoisseurship, in fact. Today one must learn how to detect forgeries just as one must learn how to admire genuine art. Forgery museums, intelligently organised, would be far more interesting and more original today than the various galleries of fine art. On more than one occasion after having traced the forger, the above system of flattering his vanity has extorted an unexpected confidence. To give an instance, some time ago, the Italian market began to be infested by good imitations of bronze figures of the type of the Paduan school. An antiquary, from whom I have the story, traced the forger to Modena, and called upon the fellow whom he held in suspicion. At first he had no clue, but finally, becoming friendly, he happened to surprise a confession from him under the following circumstances. It must be noted that a faker will talk freely on the subject of forgery, never presuming to be discovered, and always as an outsider. Speaking of imitations, the antiquary expressed his surprise at the sure modelling and most convincing patina of some recent imitations he had seen. He explained that the imitation was really so good that he himself had been deceived by a small group representing a nymph and satyr circumstances alone had saved him at the last moment from being taken in and giving his opinion by attributing the bronze to andrea briosco the piece to be sure was convincing enough to pass for one of the best works briosco ever conceived it was really worth the extravagant sums collectors were willing to pay for briosco's piece called il ricchio even though it was modern Perhaps it was worth it, remarked the artist with the characteristic rebellious accent peculiar to successful fakers. This first burst of self-pride, properly nourished by the others with eulogies of the great artist who had modelled the group, drew forth the desired disclosure. When the antiquary remarked, that group ought to bring a big price, if collectors were not, generally speaking, so utterly deprived of true artistic sense, if they were not... Such a pack of fools and snobs, interrupted the artist. The chink in the armour of silence was now discovered. Though without giving a hint as to his craft or the recipe of his wonderful patina, upon promise of silence with regard to his name, he proudly acknowledged authorship of the bronze group supposed to be of the school of Padua. 
and finally offered to show other pieces ready to enter the world of fakes, finished and ready to go, and play the part of masterpieces of the Renaissance. When the artist was asked how he managed to dispose of his faked goods, he averred that that part of the business belonged to the dealer. A specialist like himself, he said, had nothing to do with that side. The only compact he had made was with his own conscience, being perfectly aware that he was handsomely paid and that his agent realised three times as much. According to him, even museums were buying spurious works of art and labelling them with pompous attributions, knowing all the while that they were not authentic. We quote this as a mere incident to show the view and supercilious attitude taken by the faker with regard to his art. Incidentally, and from the same source, came the information that some well-imitated octagonal tables that had fetched high prices in the antique furniture market as real Quattrocento work were made in Bologna, and that the old patina and blunt corners were acquired by real use, the tables being lent for a time to cheap restaurants and the shops of sausage dealers. The bronze faker of Modena possessed one of these tables which showed a casual knife cut and the abusive age. To make the piece more handsomely suggestive, upon the top of the table there had been roughly scratched with a nail a square of the geometric lines of the old game of filetto. One could easily work up one's fancy before that perpetrated abuse and imagine crowds of lansquenets or inveterate dice-throwers. When asked why he did not put his signature to such excellent work as his, that it would certainly be valued on its own merits, he shook his head and repeated the refrain so often heard from successful fakers that the time of the old-fashioned intelligent and art-loving collectors had passed, that collecting was nowadays nothing but a fad, that the modern collector is only a pretender. In proof of his assertion, he referred to the then recent incident. See what happened to Donatello's Putino in London. To those who may have forgotten the incident, we will recall how a little bronze statue by Donatello was vainly offered for sale to the London dealers. This statue was missing from the baptistry of San Francesco of Siena. The statuette represented a putino, boy, and, hardly a foot high, had been stolen from the church at Siena in the beginning of the 19th century. It mysteriously found its way to London, where it was in all probability buried and forgotten in some private collection for three score years or more. When the forgotten statue suddenly emerged from its nook of oblivion, it was offered for sale simply as an old bronze. But being taken for a modern imitation, it fetched no decent price. A Bond Street specialist refused it at 2,000 francs. The Donatello was finally bought for 12,000 francs by the Berlin Museum, this being about the 50th part of its present value. It is curious to hear the various opinions entertained by collectors and art lovers concerning faking and its alarming and increasing success. An old collector who had, no doubt like so many of his colleagues, learned his lesson through being duped, unhesitatingly declared that faking is a grand art with a reason for existence as it seems to meet a real need of society, the need of being, as it were, deluded and cheated by elegance. Queer ethics answering to the Latin saying, Vulgus vult decipi ergo decipiato. The crowd likes to be deceived, let it be deceived. A former curator of the Victoria and Albert Museum used to pay due tribute to the art of good imitators and fakers who had succeeded in deceiving the vigilant eye of the guardians of the museum by stating that imitations are really too good to be mistaken for antiques, much better indeed than some of the examples of the art they would falsify. The really experienced collector is inclined to look upon faking as a huge joke to be played on greenhorns and the inexperienced, even although some of the silent torpedoes of faking do triumphantly succeed in hitting people who are ironclad with knowledge. Novices take two opposite views of the matter. One class is positively ashamed of having been taken in, and hides the fact by concealing the proof of his ignorance in a dark corner of the house. The other, viewing the deception in a more business-like way, has recourse to the courts with more or less happy results. The latter class is naturally inclined to favour the greatest possible severity of the law. 
In some of the cases in which the tribunals are called upon to pass judgment, one is inclined to wonder whether in pronouncing a severe sentence on the culprit, the magistrates do not feel like laughing up their sleeve at the supine foolishness of the plaintiff. The case of Monsieur Charles, a celebrated and highly esteemed mathematician and member of the Paris Institut, furnishes us with proof of how a man can be great in his own speciality, yet likely to be taken in under peculiar and rather astonishing circumstances. Monsieur Charles had apparently taken to autograph hunting, one of the most dangerous pursuits a mere dilettante can dream of. His career at the beginning was perhaps that of any neophyte, and, except for the astonishing sequence, might belong to the trite record of daily happenings on the unsafe side of curio hunting. The celebrated mathematician had hardly gathered his first autographs when to his misfortune he met with a certain Van Luca, an impostor whose talent fitted to the perfection the overtrusting mathematician. But for the documentary evidence of the trial, quoted by Paul Eudel in his book Le Trucage, it would be utterly incredible that anyone, particularly a learned man, could be gulled to such an extent. Yet, on the 16th of February, 1869, Monsieur Charles appeared before the Paris Court of Justice as a plaintiff, and the public discussion of the case, which ended in the condemnation of the defendant, Jean Luca, to two years' imprisonment and a fine of 500 francs with costs, clearly divulged how the eminent professor had been the victim of Lucier Jean Luca, a semi-learned man of unquestionable talent and a stupendous and fertile power of imagination. For the total sum of 140,000 francs he had sold to his client would-be authentic autographs and pretended indisputable original manuscripts, really the most extraordinary pieces a collector ever dreamt of. Among other things there was included a private letter of Alexander the Great addressed to Aristotle, a letter of Cleopatra to Julius Caesar informing the Roman dictator that their son Caesarion was getting on very well, a missive of Lazarus to St. Peter, also a lengthy epistle addressed to Lazarus by Mary Magdalene. It should be added that these letters were written in French, and in what might be styled an 18th century jargon, that Alexander addressed Aristotle as mon ami, and Cleopatra scribbled to Caesar, notre fille Césarion va bien. Lazarus, no less a scholar in the Gallic idiom, and to whom, maybe a miraculous resurrection had prompted a new personality, writes to St. Peter in the spirit of a rhetorician and a prig, speaking of Cicero's oratory and Caesar's writings, getting excited and anathematic on druidic rites and their cruel habit de sacrifice des hommes sauvages. Mary Magdalene, who begins her letters with a montre à mes frères Lazarus, ce que me monde de Petros la poche de notre du Jésus, is supposed to be writing from Marseille, and thus would appear to be the only one out of the many who can logically indulge in French, the jargon bouillabaisse that Franc Luca lent to the gallant array of his personages. After such a practical joke played on the excellent good faith of Monsieur Charles, some of the other autographs seem tame. The package, however, also contained scraps jotted down by Alcibiades and Pericles, a full confession of Judas Iscariot's crime written by himself to Mary Magdalene before passing the rope round his neck, a letter of Pontius Pilate addressed to Tiberius expressing his sorrow for the death of Christ. Other astounding pieces from this now famous collection were a passport signed by Vercingetorix, a poem by Abelard, and some love letters addressed by Laura to Petrarch, as well as many other historical documents down to a manuscript of Pascal and an exchange of letters between the French scientist and Newton on the laws of gravitation, the Frenchman claiming the discovery as his own. The latter manuscript caused a memorable polemic between the savants of London and Paris, a regular tournament of clever arguing among the scholars of the two countries, which finally led to the discovery of the huge fraud of which Monsieur Charles was the assigned but unresigned victim. 
the chance way the imposture was exposed makes one wonder how it was possible for the case to have the honour of serious discussion among scientists among other historical blunders is the supposition that newton would have exchanged letters with pascal on the laws of gravitation the former being but nine years old when pascal died he had certainly not yet given his mind to the observations bringing about his marvellous discovery further as an example of gravitation pascal relates that he has noticed how in a cup of coffee the bubbles are attracted toward the edge of the receptacle it is known that coffee was imported into france some nine years after the death of the great french philosopher and mathematician leaving the man who does really artistic work we are now introduced to the majority of the class mere fabricators of artistic pastiches which notwithstanding complete absence of meritorious qualities are nevertheless effective decoys for unwary art lovers to this legion belong of course the most mediocre painters and sculptors those whose chief cunning lies in the transference of age to their modern fabrications they are guided in their work mostly by a considerable amount of practice in restoring old paintings marbles stuccos and so forth there is also a peculiar type of impostor who plays his tricks solely for the fun of it a curious type who for the joy of having cheated someone will deny himself the pleasure of revealing his name and glory in his success to this stamp must have belonged m a Maye a distinguished chemist who in eighteen sixty four took the trouble to publish a book on antediluvian excavations for no other purpose evidently than to fool scholars given to that particular study needless to say the volume met with astonishing success among reproductions of genuine antediluvian relics the eminent chemist interspersed his writings with spurious and fantastic illustrations of pretended finds of his own invention they consisted of carved bones with figures symbols and mysterious writings to say that no polemic or learned appreciation of the volume followed its publication would be to slander the too easily kindled enthusiasm of learned specialists as usual the polemic revealed the true character of the volume but before reaching its conclusion there was more than one reputation sullied and more than one scientist who lost caste the perplexity and chaotic confusion caused by the publication was felt by m a maillet to be ample recompense for his labour and expense the jovial faker who is out solely for the fun of making game of someone is no modern invention notably in italy it is not uncommon to find a greek or latin inscription traced centuries ago with no apparent purpose than that of puzzling posterity or putting historians off the scent this would seem to be a still more remarkable form of faking as the author not only derives no profit whatever from his trouble but is not at all likely to be present to enjoy the result of his dupery even among these mysterious helpers of the trade and curios those who work for their living they are rarely deprived of that facetious spirit that gives them a relish for some brilliant case of deception their joy is not wholly permeated by venal considerations there is no question but that some fakers go to work like true sportsmen hearing them boast or describe some of their successful comedies in which they have been author actor and manager all in one it is not difficult to deduce that the only genuine thing to spur their imagination and activity is the desire to cheat any and everybody willing to be convinced by them or their work the chief characteristics of some of these comedies which often necessitates the help of the faker's bosom friend the dealer or go-between are pluck and an uncommon knowledge of the psychology of collectors in more than one instance psychology would appear to have actually made the impossible become possible the story of the forged rameses is still floating as a tradition in the gossipy world of antiquities in paris in his work le Trucage, paul eudel relates the anecdote in all its amusing detail a parisian collector was it seems the happy owner of the most complete collection of egyptian fine art objects not a specimen was missing apparently but as eudel observes is a collector ever ready to call his collection complete a collection is like a literary work which never seems to go beyond the preface and there is no limit to it 
The collector in question had, however, set his limit, deciding that his collection might be considered complete as soon as he had secured one of those serene-looking, colossal Egyptian statues with which to ornament and complete the courtyard of the mansion housing his collection. To be rich, to have a fixed desire, and to blazon forth one's particular hobby is a dangerous combination of ingredients in the world of curio dealing, especially with the ever-ready and active faker close to hand. To gratify this collector's hobby, an informant turned up one day to report that near Thebes, a splendid statue of heroic proportions had been discovered. It was said to be the effigy of a Ramesses in all its impassive beauty. Having knowledge of the collector's penchant, the informant's agent in Egypt had kept back the secret of the discovery. In this way, the collector was given the first refusal. The statue was all ready to be shipped, the whole at the reasonable price of a hundred thousand francs. As usual, the proposal was accompanied with convincing documents, stamped letters, descriptive memoranda, and so forth. Within view of a long-desired ornament, the collector was easily induced to take part in the transaction to be carried out with the usual secrecy, upon the condition that the statue should be taken straight to his house on its arrival, and in such a way as to preclude all knowledge on the part of others. Anyone unacquainted with the psychology of collectors, something that never happens to fakers, might be inclined to imagine that the schemer would try to hasten the conclusion of the business so elaborately planned for fear the buyer might change his mind or have his eyes opened in some way but our man knew that the collector would speak to no one lest he might lose the rare chance offered him and also that the longer the delay the more obstacles met with or surmounted the keener he would become to possess the exceptional find Finally, when the arrival of the statue was announced and it reached the Paris railway station in due time, the collector, suspicious and afraid like all true art lovers, insisted that it should be conveyed to his house by night. After so much picturesque mystery, the denouement came, as usual, too late and in the most banal manner. The fraud was exposed on the very day of the exhibition and the enraged collector started an energetic search for the culprits, but the birds had flown. He only found the empty cage, namely the atelier in a neighbouring street where his Ramesses had been given birth. The debris of the would-be oriental granite still strewed the floor. Seek transit. The faker and the forger are not prone to repentance. Van Luca who had made himself notorious by cheating Monsieur Charles, had hardly regained his liberty after serving his term before he was again called to answer for another fraud. For a poor provincial priest, he had falsified a whole genealogical tree. Paul Eudel relates of one oriental faker who proved himself as impenitent as resourceful. Clever and gifted with the peculiar shrewdness of the oriental, he made his first coup by selling to the German emperor some Moabite pottery which had certainly never been on the shores of the Jordan nor on the coast of the Dead Sea. This clever piece of trickery was recently discovered by the eminent orientalist Monsieur Clermont Gano. Back in Jerusalem and silent for a time, he next appeared in Europe offering the savants a most astonishing relic. Quite unabashed by the exposure of the Moabite pottery, he went straight to Berlin to offer some old passages of the Bible of most authentic character. They were written on narrow strips of leather supposed to have been found on a mummy. Scholars examined the precious relics with care and silently concluded to decline to enter into the bargain. The precious documents, though evidently forged, had been falsified on a piece of very old leather, the only part unquestionably aged. The surprising part was that the culprit was not at all discouraged by the first collapse of his scheme, but went to London, where he offered his biblical find to the British Museum for the trifling sum of a million pounds sterling. The plan very nearly succeeded. Daily papers became excited over the discovery of the rare Moabite manuscript, a document dating from at least the 8th or 9th century before Christ. The learned Dr. Ginsberg, who set himself to the task of deciphering the obscure and indistinct characters of the worn-out leather strips, recognised in them a fragment of the fifth book of the Pentateuch. 
when monsieur clermont ganneau came to examine the document he declared it for many reasons to be a daring forgery apart from the fact that the strips could not have enwrapped a mummy as neither hebrews nor phoenicians had the custom of embalming their dead the leather said to have been found in palestine could hardly have withstood for so long the action of a damp climate such preservation would only be possible in the dry climate of the desert or some one of the favoured parts of egypt it was discovered at the same time that the strips of the famous manuscript had been cut from a piece of leather some two centuries old the erased original character still being traceable upon which the biblical fragments had been copied in the moabite alphabet the artist with a vaster range and wider scope for duping is without doubt the one working on artistic frauds as the proportion stands at one collector of manuscripts to a thousand art collectors it is immaterial to him whether he meets specialists or eclectics in this large field they are all good game the facility with which he is thus able to dispose of his wares makes him still more refractory to reform silent often obscure always mysterious he claims for his activities what must appear to him a noble justification he paradoxically believes himself to be a real factor of his client's happiness but for him some of the collectors would find it tremendously difficult to possess manuscripts and if they die happy without realising that they have been fooled where is the difference after all in this fool's paradise they are happy and undisturbed so very few realise that they have been totally duped by a fake or partially cheated by over restoration most of the modern collectors too often resemble that type of art lover qui croit tenir les pommes d'esprit et presse tendrement une nave sur son coeur footnote who thinks he holds the apples of the hesperides whilst pressing tenderly a turnip to his heart end of footnote end of chapter seventeen